kind of wrapping up the end of Matthew chapter 12. Uh, we might have an extra week in chapter 12 because this is possibly a two-part sermon series, but the title is, is Forever Family, and I'm going to do it a little differently this morning, uh, and, and the reason is because after we read the Scripture, we're, I, I want to encourage us to, to just have some prayer as family, uh, as church family. That's, that's what I feel led to do this morning. Um, so let, let me encourage you to stand this morning in honor of the reading of God's Word. Matthew 12, verses 46 through 50. While Jesus was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. But Jesus replied to the man who told him, Who is my brother, or who is my mother, and who are my brothers? And stretched out his hands toward the disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. Family. That's ultimately what Jesus was talking about. And I know there are, in our family, um, I know there are a lot of people who are dealing with some real issues with sickness and health and stress and burdens and a lot of things. And, and you know we do this occasionally. And I just think we're talking about family today. Let me encourage you. Let's just, let's just have some prayer time. Would you just come forward? Let's just pray. Uh, we're going to get to the Scripture this morning. We're going to preach. But let's just honor God by uniting together in brotherly love. Let's unite together as family. Let's lock arms, let's hold hands, let's bow shoulder to shoulder, whatever you feel led to do. And let's just pray. If you're a visitor with us, we want to include you. Please, you're welcome. If you love Jesus, you come on. You're part of the family. Uh, this, this is just about, it's just about family, okay? That's all this is. It's about family and, and it's about just praying through. We just want to pray through because Satan's number one goal is to destroy family. It's what he wants to do. He doesn't care if it's your home family. He doesn't care if it's your church family. As long as he can cause division, that's exactly what Satan is going to do. And so, let's just bow our heads and We'll have a, some time for you to pray, and then I will, I will have prayer to conclude that. You pray. Father, I know silence makes us uncomfortable. Lord, we don't always know exactly how to pray. But what we know for certain is Satan's strategy to destroy the church starts with the family. And his goal is to cause burdens through sickness and stress through lifestyle and division through arguments. And Father, those things are not from you. 
Lord, I know there are many here this morning who have been battling some type of sickness over the last few months, the last year, the last few years. Lord, they fought. They're still fighting. They're praying hard. They're seeking your face. But the battle is real. And Satan is, it seems like, always on the charge. But we want to put him on his heels this morning. Father, we want to pray him out. We want to run him away. We want to call on the name of Jesus to defeat strongholds and break those down, whatever barrier might be standing in our way as family. Lord, that they would be destroyed this morning. That there would be no stronghold Satan casts on us that will stand. Father, that you would always be honored and glorified in our midst. That when, when Satan does come with his attacks, that we would just unite together even stronger than we were before, seeking your face, seeking to do your will, seeking to honor you with our lives, with the things we do, with the things we say. Father, seeking to win the lost to Jesus. Father, this morning, we praise you because I believe we are a family united. Lord, to be used of you as living vessels is our plea. Father, what would you have First Baptist Church, Henderson, Tennessee, do? How would you have us move forward in our community? How would you have us be on the forward move against the things that Satan throws against us, Father, and I pray that you would lead our charge so that your kingdom might be furthered. Father, it is in Christ Jesus' holy name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. you make your way back, I'm going to get a drink of water. <clears throat> Friends, we're going to, for a moment, just kind of focus on this scripture. Um, for the next few minutes, I, I don't know how long the, the message will be this morning. Uh, I haven't preached through it. Um, you know, just thinking about family and how important family is, there are a lot of times we forsake family. We, we, we know, we, we kind of think for a moment, you know, well, really, who, who is our family? What, what does family look like? Who, who is it that, that it is, is a part of, of my family, the Patterson family, the, the clan, and was a couple of years ago, Caitlin was taking a history class and, and she had to do a family tree. She had to map out where her family came from and, and she went back as far as she was able to go but seems like most of the Patterson clan came from Ireland area and um, I, I just, I, I was thinking about that and, you know, a little bit of Irish and, and I don't even know what Irish looks like. I mean, he's, he's a little green guy, right? That's, I mean, is that, is that Irish? I, I don't know. But, um, you know, they, most of, of the Pattersons, they came off the boat. They were sharecroppers. They were hard workers. Um, th they ended up in, in the New York area and then they began to make their way south towards Tennessee, Mississippi. They even went deeper. And, and I don't know if you're aware of this, but there are Pattersons everywhere. You know, I mean, they're, they're just, they really, really are. And well, my clan, my Patterson, kind of settled in the West Tennessee area. My, my great-grandfather um, 
My grandfather, Talmadge Patterson, and, and Talmadge then had several brothers. They were all huge men. They were like giants. I mean, they're just, just really big, tall men. My, my grandfather um, and, and his brothers all had large families. I mean, they were all just, you know, each one of my grandfather's brothers, it seems like they had five or six kids. My grandfather had um, six children with my grandmother, and it's just a large family. And, and when I, I think about that now, I'm kind of amazed just to think how large the Patterson family is. I mean, it's, it's a big family. We, it was so large that we weren't ever able to get together as a group because there were just so many people stretched out so far and wide that there, were, there was really no good place for us to come together. And so we would have Christmases at, at Grandmama and Granddaddy um, Patterson's and everyone would squeeze in their little bitty living room. Even then, they had an open floor concept house and so their living room and their kitchen kind of went in together but it was just an old house. At some point, they just tore a wall down to make room because they had six kids and, and when you got everyone in the one room, it was just such a small room. And I remember my grandmother, you know, she has, ha, has about 24 grandchildren, a lot of grandchildren. And then, and then all of us had children ourselves, and, and then some of us are, are getting ready to have children on top of that. And so, you know, that, that legacy as far as the Patterson name, as far as family, it just continues to grow. And so when we think about family, that's, that's what comes to mind, isn't it? I mean, I mean that's family. But what does the Scripture say about family? Because to me, that has to be the most important thing that we're talking about. I mean, you know, I, I know that I've got the Patterson blood running through my veins, but according to Acts chapter 17, verse 26, just, just listen to the Scripture. Acts chapter 17, you know, we think about where family comes from. And he, he being God... He made from one man. So, so God took creation, and then he, he made from one man. So we know what God did. He formed Adam out of what? The dust of the earth. And then from, from Adam's side, he caused a deep sleep, and then he pulled a rib out, and from the rib he created woman, he created Eve. And so we have Adam, the first man. We have Eve, the first woman, and they began the first family. And from them, family spread far and wide. And so the scripture says right here, and he and God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. But listen up to what else. This is fantastic because it says, having determined the allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places. So not only did God have everything to do with humanity, He also had everything to do with when you were going to be born, where you were going to be born, what that boundary of humanity was going to look like. So for the Pattersons, you know, whether we, we started in Ireland, it, it even goes further than that, you understand? We all started in the Garden of Eden. When God created man in his own image, you and I literally, because of our creator, have the same blood coursing through our veins. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever considered that? We, we don't always communicate really well together, and, and sometimes we have... You know, uh, uh, we're, we're a misfit. Sometimes we, um, we, we don't love the way we need love. Sometimes there's not unity the way God desires for us to have unity. But have you ever really thought that we are all family? I don't care what color you are. I don't care what ethnicity you are. I don't care if you're Caucasian or white or brown or tan or red or yellow, none of those things matter because according to the Word of God, we are all from the same bloodline. Now, some people, that probably makes the blood boil just a little bit. 
But this is what God said. I, I'm not making this up, right? You know, we, we all started from this one bloodline, this one family, this one people group. This is where you and I originated from. And then, you know, our families just grew and grew and grew. And even in the Old Testament days, you know, we, they got all the way up to the point of the Tower of Babel. You know, they, they thought we're going to stay together. We're going we're gonna to build an empire. We're going to build this ziggurat, all this this uh, mountain of a building all the way up into heaven. I mean, they literally said that they wanted to reach God's heaven. They were going to build as high as they could. Pride then had begun to kind of do what pride always does. It, you know, we, we don't need God, but, but we're going to make ourselves equal with God. We're going to build a building up to God. And then, you know, the, that flat top part of that ziggurat, that, that building that they were building, is literally the idea for that thing is, is supposed to represent heaven for them. You know, as they were building up. And, and God just, he's like, you know, this is, this is not my intention. And so then what God did, table of nations kind of kind of a thing if you know anything about Genesis and the Old Testament and and then from there God came down and he changed language and he spread people out all over the face of the world I mean that that's how we got to the point we are here today while our other relatives are somewhere else because God spread us out. And now, because division has kind of taken place, Satan had planted those seeds over and over and over and over again because as people began to multiply on the face of the earth, it was harder for people to get along. Satan was doing his job. I mean, you know, uh, Satan got kicked out of heaven and, and he'd been on the earth for a really, really long time, guys. And so... He had this plan devised. And I just need us to understand that what, what God really desires from us is that we understand where we came from. And so, while Jesus was still speaking, his mother and his brother showed up and they stood outside. They asked to speak with Jesus and he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? Now I want you to watch this. Look at verse 49. And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers, stretching out his hand. D do you know the one thing that, th there's a little bit of symbolism here, foreshadowing of Christ stretching those arms out, going to the cross. I, I hope you can see that because it's, it's right here in, in black and white. He, he stretched his hands out towards the disciples and he said, here are my brothers and my sisters and my mothers. And do you know the one thing, the one thing that causes you and I to be blood relatives still is the precious blood of Jesus that was spilled on Calvary's hill? It, it, it's all about the blood because Christ desired to reclaim his creation. He desired to reclaim his family. He wanted us to be united once again. What Satan, the rift that Satan had caused, Jesus came in order to do away with that disunity, that dysfunction. The only way for you to be back as a part of the family of God then is to follow the commandments of the Father, to do the Father's will. Look at, at verse 50, the scripture says. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven. So what does God's will look like? How do you and I really wrap our mind around the will of God? The will of God literally is the desire of God's heart. In other words, God had a perfect plan from the beginning and he expects his creation to fulfill what his will is. His is a good and perfect will is what the scripture says. It's perfect. So, so if God has a perfect will and he desires that we would follow his will, we need to really kind of understand what that looks like, especially for the family of God. Amen? 
So we'll look at some things, and, and we'll even talk more about that probably next week because it's unity and love that, that I want to stress. It's what God wants. We've, we've got to work hand in hand together. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven, I, I know that sometimes is hard for me to swallow. Why can't I do my will? Why can't it be the way I want it to be? Why can't it be the way you want it to be? Well, because a lot of times when, when we get prideful, we think that, that what we believe really matters or what you believe really matters. The reality is it always has to revert back to what God believes, what matters to Him. How does He view the church? How does He view you and I as a family? And so, so important for us in the will of the Father. And let's talk about some scripture real quick. John chapter 15, verse 14. You write these down if you want to. Hang on to them. Remember them. Because this is what he said. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command. You are my friends if you do what I command. It's John chapter 15, verse 14. A friend of God and, and family, are, are, are they really so different? Could they, really, could they be synonyms? Well, here the answer is yes. They can be synonyms, especially when you understand that we all come from the same bloodline. When we all originated in the garden with, with Adam and Eve as they created and then they multiplied and they spread throughout all of the world. I mean... To understand that, that I can be friends with God. I mean, and He is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. That is what the Bible says of Jesus. And that's what we need to understand when, when we come to those moments in life where we're just frustrated with how things are going. Because the reality is we all get to that point at some time or another. Hey, we just, we just want to throw in the towel. We just want to throw, in, throw our hands in. We just want to quit. Be honest. How many of you have ever wanted to quit? Don't, don't lie. Raise your hand if you just ever wanted to quit. Yeah. That's exactly where Satan wants us, isn't it? He wants us to quit. He wants us to throw in the towel. He wants us to give up. And, and you have to understand, when we get to that point in life, one of the things that we're giving up on is God Himself. I mean, if you're a child of God and, and you have confessed your sin and you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, then God expects you to live a certain way. You, there's, a, there's a lifestyle expectation He has for you. So if you are my friends... You will do what I command. These commands. Well, here we are again. Well, preacher, I, I thought it was by grace you have been saved through faith, and not by works. It, it's it, just following the commands. Well, well, what are all of these commands of Jesus? And, and so he, he has a certain way that you and I are supposed to live our lives. And we understand in every single family there is a set of rules that... That are defined, even if those particular rules might not be stated all the time. I mean, you know what I desire more than anything? Can I, oh, I'm just going to share this. What I desire more than anything, and I mess up every single day. What I desire more than anything to be obedient to my Father. I fall short so often. You fall short so often. We're going to always fall short. This reason is so important when we find ourselves in moments of weakness that we pick ourselves up, we dust ourselves off, and we continue to move forward with Jesus. Pressing on towards the goal is what Paul preached. Pressing on on towards the goal of, of the upward call that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I mean, if we were to stay the same, then we would never be moving forward with Jesus, would we? If a child stayed the same after it was born out of its mother's womb, there would never be any progress, there would never be any growth. 
what God desires is that we always be dependent upon Him, but we have to get to a point where we learn to be obedient to the Scripture, to the Word of God. He spoke this for us. Listen to John 14, verse 15. So the first one was John 15, 14. Now we're going to John 14, verse 15. If you love me, now, now we're getting into love. Love's important, isn't it? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus is telling the disciples these things always. He's, he's talking to those that are in earshot because everyone seemed like always had their own agenda. And one thing we've learned over the years is our agenda is useless when it comes to honoring God. I've tried. You've tried. Now let's do it God's way, and I, I think if we'll, we'll do it God's way. And so, if you love me, Jesus said, if you love me. How many lovers of Jesus do we have? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. All of the things Jesus was teaching the disciples. The Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, you know, turning the other cheek, going the extra mile. I mean, he laid that sermon out in Matthew 5 through chapter 7. And it was such a beautiful, beautiful scripture. Such a beautiful sermon. Such a beautiful testimony on how God the Son expects us to live our lives. Honoring Him with the things we say, honoring Him with the things we do. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. First John, oh, there's lots of Johns today. First John chapter 5, verse 3 says it this way. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. I mean, John 14, verse 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now, 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. I, I have no issue loving my brother David. No issue. I mean, David, I think we talk every Monday. You know I love you, man. I really, really have a love for you. But here's the funny thing, is he can even love a little old somebody like me. Do you know he's even told me that he loves me? How great is that? I, I mean, I, I've, got, I've got other brothers and sisters in here. Um, Brad Graves, where are you at? Are, he's outside. He's not even in here this morning. He's, he's got a gun on his hip, I guess, walking around. I when I talk to, to Brad Graves, he says, I love you, brother. You know what I tell him? I love you, brother. Miss Becky. How often have you said, I love you, Brother Brad? Just give me a hug and say, I love you. You know what? I love you so passionately. So passionately. And, and, and it's, it's not just those. So many of you, that's what church, that's what family is. It's that kind of love. Even when Satan tries to, to plant a wedge right in the middle of what God is doing, you love one another. It's so good to be loved, isn't it? I mean, to, to just, just to have that feeling of where your heart is just overflowing with joy because you know that the rest of the world may hate your guts, but God loves you. Not only does God love you, I love you. family. Doesn't matter what we've said. Doesn't matter how badly we've hurt one another's feelings. Because that's all water under the bridge. You know what matters? If you decide to love me today. You know what matters is if I decide to love you today. You know what matters is if we love God today. It's, it's that it's that response always. It's, it's, it's forgiveness. For, again, forgetting those things that are behind. It doesn't matter who has mistreated you. It doesn't matter who has mistreated me. None of those things matter. What matters is the decision we're going to make this very moment as being a part of the forever family of God. 
to move forward with Jesus. I mean, that, that has to happen for us. I see, I see so many, I'm going to be honest with you, so many congregations fighting with one another. You've seen it. We fight. We, we don't like this idea. We don't like that idea. This doesn't fit my, fit my agenda. That, that doesn't, and it doesn't matter. We've got to let it go. We've got to decide today the First Baptist Church, Henderson, Tennessee, is going to live to be obedient to the commandments of God. Amen. Not man-made commandments. It's, it's the focus on Jesus. This is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. God loves us. Right? That love is an unconditional love, but that same unconditional love is exactly the love you and I are supposed to have for one another. I mean, that, that passionate love. You know, when you call me at 2 o'clock in the morning, I've had those calls. Some of you, there's a couple in here who've called me at 2 o'clock in the morning. And you go. You put your shoes on, you put your clothes, you don't put your shoes on first. I've done that before. You put your shoes on, you brush your teeth as quickly as you can because, you know, that nighttime breath is really bad. You get dressed and you get in the vehicle and you go to the hospital. You stay all night. I mean, you, you do whatever you have to do because you have a family member that's suffering. You have a family member that's in need. And, and, and it's not just me. You have done those very same things. You have received those very same calls in the middle of the night. And because you have a love for your brother and sister in Christ, you do whatever it takes to get right to them. That's, that's what we do, isn't it? So, this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. And it, His commandments are not burdensome. Just not going to be burdensome. You and I being unified should not be burdensome. Satan calls the division. Satan calls the rift. Following the word of God is not burdensome. When, when following God's word becomes burdensome, then it, all, it has to revert back to the condition of our hearts as individuals and then as a church. It's not burdensome. And then... Really, you know, the father expects obedience from his families and unity from, his, from her people, from the church. We need to be single-minded and focused. We need to have a love for the lost. We've got to be outward focused. Let's take the attention off of us for a moment. Let's put the attention on the work God has created that we should walk in beforehand according to Ephesians. And then we've got to be a going people. And you know Matthew 28 verse 18 through 20 has been preached and shared so many times from the pulpit. You have heard it from me. You have heard it from Brother Stan. You've heard it from other pastors along the way about being a God-honoring, going people. We can't go if we're always dysfunctional. If we're always fighting amongst ourselves. And, and I, we're not fighting. I, I'm just, this is where we are in the text. This is what I'm sharing. But to understand the big picture of God's desire for us and then, and then to listen, to, the, the, these are the very last words Jesus left the disciples with. They might be important. They might be worth remembering. Hey, what about this? They might be worth obeying. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18, and Jesus came and he said to them, he came to the disciples, he was getting ready to ascend into heaven, and he says this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Everything. All authority. It, it literally means I have the power to make any decision that I want to make, and, and I, every decision, every power, all of that authority has been given to me. I am now the sovereign, ruling, reigning king of heaven and earth. That's what Jesus was saying. He was testifying to the disciples who were there. He came and he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. 
Everything. Everything. And then he left this. He said, go, therefore. And make disciples of all nations. Why did he say make disciples of all nations? Are you ready for this? Do you remember Acts chapter 17 verse 26? Because God created from one bloodline every people group on the earth. We are his creation. And God desires that we would take the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen to this. The saving gospel of Jesus Christ to every person who will hear it. So here it is, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. When we baptize, why do we say in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? Jesus told us to. The Godhead, three in one. This is who God is. He is Father. He is Son. He is Holy Spirit. They make up God. Amen. We're to be obedient to God. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Teaching them. You and I are to make disciples. We've got to, we've got to do a better job at being a disciple-making church. I mean, when you and I get on board together with being disciple makers, then, then you and I will be meeting with people at 5.30 in the morning at Jack's restaurant, eating a biscuit, talking about Jesus. Making disciples. Because as we make a disciple, they become a disciple of Jesus. We're now teaching them to observe all that we have been commanded. What have we been commanded to do? To love the unlovable not to allow Satan to cause disunity and dysfunction. We, we have been called to be a people of action. We've been called to be a people who, who are going. So teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And then he says this, remember this. Behold, pay attention. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He said, I will be with you wherever you go. Until I return, I will always be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You will not be abandoned. You will always be a child of God. You will always be a part of the family of God if you really are ready to understand what the takeaway of the day is. And here it is. I'm going to lay this out there. I'm going to wrap this thing up. Takeaway of the day is to be a part of God's family, you must obey His commandments to trust His Son, Jesus, with your life. Forever family. You want to be a part of a forever family? I mean, we see these commercials about adoption. You can adopt a puppy. You can adopt a child because they want to be a part of a forever family. You can have been raised in a home with the most loving father and the most loving mother and still not be a part of the family of God. But you can be. You can be a part of this forever family. And to be a part of God's family, you must obey His commandment to trust His Son, Jesus, with your life. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Let's just let's hang out there for just a moment. So many people have gotten the confess with your mouth part right. And then they skip the believe in your heart. I mean, you want to be a part of it this forever family, then, then you've got to believe Jesus is who he says. He, he is the Redeemer. He's the one whose blood was shed on an old rugged cross. He's the one that was raised on the third day. I mean, to be a part of this forever family because the life you and I live here on earth is fleeting. You can literally be here today and gone tomorrow. I don't control the dates anyone is born. I don't control the dates anyone breathes their last on the earth. 
all of those things belong to God. I mean, he even said, Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes, there's a day to be born and there's a day to die. Even this, life is but a vapor. I mean, to understand these things, and so, so if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God is raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now listen to the explanation in verse 10. Because with the heart one believes and is justified, found righteous, made righteous. With the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. I mean, just to be able to say, oh, Lord Jesus, I confess that you are the most high God with your mouth. Oh, Lord Jesus, I confess you are my Savior. I repent of my sin. I turn from my way. I invite Jesus to be Lord of my life. You say that, you mean that. You live that belief by keeping God's Word, by learning and growing. And then verse 11, for the Scripture says everyone who believes in Him will not be put to shame. Miss Janice, David, Steve, will y'all come? Whoever believes this will not be put to shame. Make sure you can hear me, please. God is good, amen. You know, there's coming a time when everyone in this room will be dead. In the physical body, there's coming a time when you'll no longer be here. But your soul will live on You'll either live on in heaven, in the presence of King Jesus, or you'll forever be separated. And you know, as badly as I want to see every person I ever share the gospel with repent and trust Jesus, I know it's not going to happen that way. I wish I could be that one where million upon millions are saved because I've preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. How wonderful would that be, amen? That when you talk to somebody about Jesus, they, they say, I want to do that right now. I want to, I just want to ask Jesus to be my Lord. And I believe that in my heart. Today, you can be part of the forever family. The forever family of God. If you'll acknowledge that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Today, will you repent? Will you tell Jesus? Will you tell God the Father that you are sorry for making a mockery out of him, <laughs> I've done that so many times. Repenting of your sin and saying, I, Lord Jesus, I just ask you to come in and be my Savior. Would you, would you make that decision today? Would you, would you like to be part of the forever family? I want to share this. There is no other name given among heaven, among men, by which we must be saved. you don't accept Jesus as your Savior, I'm sorry to be the one to bear this news to you, but if you do not trust Jesus as your Savior, you don't become a part of the forever family of God. If Jesus doesn't become your Savior. You die and you go to hell without Jesus as your Lord. So we're going to have an invitation. I don't care whether in your mind, 
you thought you have been a Christ follower for the last 70 years, but in your heart you've never really believed it. Today, would you make a decision for Jesus and mean it? Maybe you're here and it's the first time you've really ever heard the gospel. Would you turn to Jesus today? You come, you talk to me this morning. If, if it's needed, there'll be some deacons come down and you can talk with them as well. But today, would you make that decision? David, you lead. Let's stand. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way when we do his good will.